Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Any Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War, and today I'm joined by none other than Italian Spartacus. What's going on, man? Not much, man. Excited to talk about the Arabians. Yep, we are joined here today to talk about Araby, a minor human faction closely modeled after the civilizations near our own Arabian Peninsula, and borrowing liberally, as Games Workshop is wont to do, from the collection of Middle Eastern folk tales known as 1001 Nights. Now, Araby might be considered a minor faction, but their homeland is an important component of the Great Vortex campaign map, a relatively central location nestled in the northwest corner of the Southlands. You know, that continent that isn't Africa. Now, positioned on the coast alongside the Great Ocean, the merchants, traders, and powerful navies of the Arabians are in a great spot to interact with the other continents in Total War Warhammer 2's campaign. They're in a great spot to fight for control over the Vortex, and perhaps most importantly, they directly border Nehekara and the Land of the Dead, where the Tomb Kings reside. As we've discussed previously, the Tomb Kings are the frontrunners as the first major DLC in Total War Warhammer 2, and are the only major Warhammer fantasy battle race that makes sense as DLC for Game 2 in general. Araby and the Undead of Ancient Nehekara are inextricably linked, not just geographically, but from a long-lost period of history called the Wars of Death, an invasion by Ark and the Black that ravaged their people and their lands, setting them back thousands of years. Currently, the coast of Araby, Land of Assassins, and the Land of the Dervishes are inhabited by Bretonian and Empire subfactions, a callback to the Holy Crusades of the last millennia, where knightly orders from the Old World brought war to the subcontinent. But these seem like placeholders for now, and ultimately, these pieces of knowledge and an understanding that Creative Assembly simply won't be able to add additional major factions after the Tomb Kings until Game 3 gives us some pretty solid evidence to suggest that minor factions like a playable Araby are in the cards. This is the last hurrah of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. We've seen what was done with Norska, a minor faction without an official army book, and this is why we're talking about Araby in the first place. I think they've got a decent shot of making it into the trilogy. So let's talk about them. Start with a basic overview, then we can jump into the major events that shaped Araby's history. Now, as you might imagine, Araby is characterized by vast expanses of desert, a fractured kingdom of scorching hot wastelands dotted with tropical paradise, oasis in the sands that glitter like the ornate jewels of the richest sultans. On the coastline, where most of the city-states were founded, spices, gold, and the lucrative slave and jewel trades dominate the economic landscape, as the sheikhs and emirs monopolize the silk roads and barter with far eastern nations. As a result, Kofar, Le Sheikh, and Martek are amongst the richest cities in the known world, with easy access to the seas and powerful trading fleets. Gold from Lustria, where the lizardmen don't really care about such material possessions, concubines from Cathay, and exotic food, drink, and drugs from all over the known world make these city-states some pretty awesome places to party, provided you don't cross anyone rich and powerful. But this is Warhammer. Things are never as pleasant as they seem on paper, and this is true for Araby as any other kingdom on the planet. Hashashin prowl the rooftops, animals on sale in the marketplaces are as likely to break out and gut you as they are to sing the songs of their masters, and the sheikhs themselves are known worldwide for their brutality. Their liberal use of torture and heavy-handed punishments of petty crime are legendary. Simply being in the wrong place at the wrong time will get you dead real quick here, in a land where necromancers try desperately to master their craft with off-catastrophic results, and summon jinns and evil spirits wreak havoc and eviscerate innocence far and wide. Still, like in Talea and Astalia, inventors, navigators, traders, and mercenaries can ply their trades and become fabulously wealthy here, so people from all over the world gravitate to Araby. The kingdom is essentially divided between the autonomous great city-states, who form a loose coalition in times of strife, and technically fall under the jurisdiction of the Grand Sultan, but in practice, he is more of a figurehead like the Shogun during the Meiji period, and holds little political power over the other regions. Still though, Lashik, the core province under the Sultan's command, is home to one of the most powerful fleets on the planet, and the center of the massive slave trade that deals with nations as far away as Norska. So the Sultan is far from powerless. Now it is important for me to mention here that the High Elves of Ulthuan do have a mercantile presence in both Lashik and Kofar, and they do trade freely with the Arabians all the time, but typically prevent the Dows and Great Galleys from traveling further west than Ulthuan itself, 
Basically, they don't want anybody going anywhere near Nagaroth and the Dark Elves, and frankly, it's probably a good thing. Even more independent than the autonomous city-states themselves are the fierce tribes of the Adelan Mountains, Cobra Pass, and the Great Desert. Great warriors like the fanatic dervishers who are trained almost from birth to kill in the name of their god. And as we might expect, because Games Workshop is not particularly creative, it's a monotheistic religion, which the Arabians follow, closely modeled after Islam. The history of Araby is one marked with strife, and death, and war. So not too different from the other lands of the Warhammer Fantasy Battle universe. Let's pass it over to our boy Mr. Italian Spartacus to go more in depth with the origin of the Errantry Wars and the Crusades and the other events that shaped Araby over the long millennia. All right, yeah, there, there were quite a few events that shaped the early history of Araby, um, especially to note the Great Crusades. Uh, the Great Crusades, as we know from our history, are when uh, all of Christendom went on a, a grand crusade into the holy land of jerusalem and as they did that they, they went through all of uh europe and all through the majority of greece they went through constantinople you know that whole that whole jam with this you've got bretonia and empire really squaring off against araby at, on its own it really was a three-year-long war in which uh, king louis of bretonia marched on araby after the fall of Estalia. And really this is the largest gathering of knights that we see outside of any other point in, in Warhammer history, outside of maybe the end times, but we don't like to talk about that. Um, the Empire joins in as well, but not so much with the full kind of uh, dedication and full kind of commitment that Bretonia puts in. And really the, the origins of this crusade come from the sorcerer Jafar, uh, which is about as unique of a name as you can imagine from a Middle Eastern themed evil sorcerer. Uh, but Sorcerer Jafar unites the nomadic trade people, or the nomadic uh, trade people of the deserts into the Sultanate of Araby is what it's called. And, you know, as, as any pride was talking about with the wars of the dead, the Arabian people are pretty scattered at this point. And that's why Jafar unites them. And he actually allies with the Skaven for a lot of services and assassination. And as a result, that they pay them in Warpstone, because as we all know, Skaven just sit there and huff Warpstone all day. Um, the Skaven then convince him of a series of conspiracies from Estalia. And the really weird thing about Skaven is you, you don't really know if were they trying to manipulate him into attacking Estalia, or were they just paranoid themselves of certain certain things and voicing it? Because the Skaven are like that; they are paranoid and they are manipulative and they are that kind of just little twitchy little nonsense creatures. But Astalia is essentially run by two important cities, right? Uh, Bilbali and Magrita. So uh, Magrita, to the, located to the south, actually falls quite quickly as Sorcerer Jafar invades without warning and as kind of almost like a blitzkrieg into Astalia. Astalia itself has no real standard military or state troops. It's run entirely off of mercenaries and hired armies. So you know, the house guards that you would see that would be for like the Lucinis and stuff like that. They're only loyal to the highest dollar value. So for the most part, Araby, which is a unified state military standardized army, is just gonna roll through what Astalia has established. So uh, Araby then begins to march on Bilbali, and this really kind of backs Astalia against the wall with you know half of their nation captured, the south southern portion of it, Bilbali being in the north. Uh, so King Louis from Bretonia notices this and declares the first actual errantry war. This isn't just the Great Crusades, it's both. And who's to say, you know, is did he do this to prevent a possible invasion from Araby? Because Astalia is, you know, it goes Astalia, then it goes Tilia, then it goes Bretonia. And if he was, if uh, Jafar was able to blow through Astalia so easily, it needless to say that he could be on Bretonia's doorstep in no time. Or is this a genuine delivery of justice here? So the kind of motivation from King Louis is kind of suspect in some regards. But Emperor Frederick III of the, uh, the Empire agrees to send knightly orders and to summon the elect accounts so that he has their consent, but he doesn't really commit fully to this. He was saying like, hey, I'm dealing with a lot of civil war and, and strife, and I'm just kind of coming down from that in my own territories. Here's the knightly orders. He kind of galvanizes them into saying, go to it. And he tells the elector counts, commit whatever units you can. So Araby, Araby in the meanwhile is beginning to march on to borrow. And 
To borrow, it was kind of seen as, as Arrested Nostalgia as kind of an easy target, but that's not the case. So as to, uh, to borrow itself is separate from Tilia and Nostalgia. We see it on the kind of Western or Western Tilian coast at the top of the Tilian Sea, right about where you would see Skaven Blight, right by those uh, Marches of Madness. It's essentially a city set within and around a giant cave with a very hazardous coastline to the south of it. So it kind of has a natural uh, southern seawall. So it's far more prepared for an attack and has a military armed with what they call their deep watch that delve into like, there's this huge spanning tunnel system that extends beneath the city. And they, the deep watch are the ones that kind of monitor and patrol through this tunnel system. And they're a little bit more adept to fighting because they've been squaring off against Skaven in this tunnel system nonstop for the majority of the history of Tabarro. And this uh, giant seawall, like I was talking about, really kind of helps prevent the southern access to the city. So Araby can't surround the city and invade. And Araby eventually actually gets defeated at Tabarro, despite being vastly outnumbered. And with that, you actually have the kind of the grand moment with the when the Empire arrives, the Empire and Bretonia, really. So the Grand Empire Bretonian army arrives in Astalia, winning back some of the territory um, that has already been captured from Araby. So the bulk of the Crusader Knights were just that, heavy cav Crusader Knights. The Arabian armies, on the other hand, are not really suited for that kind of combat in, in these open, lush fields. They're, they're suited for the desert kind of land combat of Araby. So you have these lightly armored units, lightly armored cav, squaring off against very traditional, heavy European shock cav. And this really kind of forced Jafar to flee. He, he leaves Amir Wazar in charge of Magrita, and Amir Wazar's got his his band of black scimitar guards, and that that's going to be important a little bit here. But it's really a token force. It's not anything substantial. It's just mainly to give to waylay a little time for Jafar to give him time to build up an army again. So the Crusader army realizes that they really need to split up here. They they can't give Jafar that time to rebuild a whole new army to come back at them with. They're going to get bogged down at that point. So one force stays and fights in Magrita. The other goes for Araby. And the force that stays for Magrita is, again, a token force. So you've got these two token forces kind of squaring off against each other. And this is this whole time period is really where the origin of the Knights of the Blazing Sun come from and a number of knightly orders. So 60 or so of the original founding knights were at that, bar, that Battle of Magrita. And when the fighting was really the fiercest, there's this statue of Myrmidia. And Myrmidia is one of the patrons, patron, not patron saints, this isn't a <laughs> Catholicism, one of the patron gods of Tilia and Astalia uh, that actually falls over and it almost crushes them. But instead, it falls and kills Amir Wazar and his entire Black, Tar Black Scimitar guards. So you kind of have that, these elite Arabian soldiers kind of in the same vein as, um, the Persian immortals you could think of from 300, just these elite kind of kill teams. So in Myrmidia's honor, they form the Knights of the Blazing Sun. And the Knight of the Blazing Sun is the symbol of uh, Myrmidia. So they kind of do this as an ode to her. And the rest of the Crusaders assemble a, a, a massive navy after this, uh, as, as the whole Battle of Magrita is going and succeeding, actually, as they retake Magrita. The Crusader armies uh, sail over to Araby and they bring really the full might of the Crusader Knights to Jafar's front door. And this is important to note because this is like a, a horizon to horizon spanning army. This is no just simple, small, Bretonian, the lady wills it army. This is massive. And during this time though, Jafar really gets a chance to actually prepare for an invasion for this. He already knows his enemy. He sees his enemy and he's now shown his enemy that he can be beaten. And at, at that point, up until you know the Battle of Tavaro, he he couldn't be. So it showed it his his own army's morale is starting to kind of crack at this point. So he has to do he has to win something. So he prepares for this invasion, and heavily fortifies the trading port of Kofar. And despite these fortifications, though, the Arabians were not prepared for the zealous fervor of the combined Crusader army. So they've already been invigorated by all these wins. They've already recaptured Magrita. Now at this point, they're just coming in to kick some ass and take some names. They're they're here to delve out some Bretonian justice for the Lady of the Lake. So 
the majority of the inhabitants of Kofar are completely killed and the rest of the city is, is raised to the ground. So this is really though, Jafar being Jafar, an evil sorcerer, all part of his plan. Uh, this was what was a benefit for Astal for uh, the Crusader Knights in Astalia has really become their undoing in Araby. And this is very true to form with what we see in the European Crusades. The lightly armored mobile forces of Araby can simply outrun the heavier Crusader army, which really turns into a multi-year stalemate here. They're, they're kind of slogging through these, these desert wastelands trying to catch up to Arabian forces and they just end up getting exhausted or they end up getting completely overrun. So the Crusaders kind of take their, their toll on Araby though over time. They're slowly kind of draining Jafar's cloud because the tribes are beginning to revolt because they're seeing nothing but uh, retreat after retreat after retreat. It's kind of in the same mo notion of early American history with George, or George Washington constantly retreating from the British, but without an actual plan this time because that whole plan actually came to fruition perfectly for him. This, not so much so. <laughs> um, but Jafar's cloud, again, does start to fall off, and his tribes do start to revolt, to, to revolt. And as a result, he holds up in El Haik. And this is really kind of a point where he prepares for the grand battle, because this is the capital of his power. This is where it all kind of has to go down. And as the Crusader army approaches, the tribesmen really get crazy, and they rage against Jafar like mad. So rather than a prolonged siege, Jafar doesn't want to deal with that. Jafar doesn't want to sit embroiled in a city that's falling apart and give the Crusader Knights a chance to be okay with, with their current climate, to sit there on the outskirts of the walls and sit in their camps and eventually wait it out. Jafar decides to take it to the enemy. So he sallies forth to fight the Crusaders out in the desert plains, thinking the heat's really gonna assist him, right? So both armies meet that day. You've got these two infantry lines just slamming into each other. You have wild elemental spirits casting fell magics and, and decimating the front lines as they wade through the combat. You have crusader armies just beginning to lose footing. You know, as as the hot sun beats down on their already battered position, I and mean, Jafar had had surely won the war for Araby. But in a, in a pure Lord of the Rings, two towers from the east, or even from uh, Turn of the King, from the east comes the sound of hooves trampling across the terrain. Thousands upon thousands of heavily armored knights finally being able to put their weight and armor to use crash into the flank of Jafar's line. And the Crusader Knights just melt through the lines of Arabian foot soldiers, metal smashing into metal as they reap their lightly armored foes. And really this is an immortalized charge. This is the Riders of Rohan charge into the Urukai, the Riders of Rohan charge to liberate Minas Tirith. You know, this, there's so much blood that's spilled and so much that it actually tinges what becomes the Red Desert. And the, the grand outcome of this um, crusade is that Jafar dies. He, he gets killed fleeing from the battlefield from some just nameless Bretonian, which is a pretty you know, ignoble death. But with Jafar's death, Bretonia kind of like, kind of in the same vein as dwarves, uh, Bretonia kind of just considers their honor paid and leaves. Yeah, well, we've done <laughs> the... Uh, the grudge is paid and just goes back home. But the Imperial Knights, on the other hand, in, in again, Imperial faction and fashion, um, they stay and just start hunting everything down and destroying the remnants of Jafar's really dark empire. And this is where, again, the birth of a lot of knightly orders begins because the, you have a little portion with the Knights of the Blazing Sun, but the Knights of the Panther, or, or they were not actually the Knights of the Panther just yet, but they tracked the final army of Jafar near uh, Martek. And the army was the, the Crusader army was beset by mutants and mutant vultures and panthers nonstop. So the knights kill these panthers, use their pelts to adorn their own armor to scare and terrify um, the, uh, the the remnants of Jafar's army, and they slaughter them to the man. So from that, they, they there all these these stories spread of these knights panther that that reap through what was left of Jafar's army, and. Finally, all the Crusader Knights ventured home and left Araby to its devices. But in, in that time, you've got Sudenberg, which we've seen on the Total War Warhammer 2 uh, map for uh, some of the minor factions. That's when Sudenberg gets established as a penal colony, more or less, for the Empire. This is where they can send all their criminals, this is where they can kind of keep a closer eye on, uh, not Jafar, but keep a closer eye on Araby. But this is what, this is what kind of puts Araby the way we have it today divided but established its own dominance through its city-states, religion, and, and ruling class, really. 
So you kind of have a similar feel to Astalia and Tilia in that it's got city-states that rule over it, not just one overarching uh, monarchy. But that's kind of what shapes it here is these ultimate crusades. And I guess this would be a good time, if any, to kind of segue into, since we've talked about the, the armies of Araby, um, a good time to talk about you know, the Grand Viziers and the Great Sultans, the, the, really the leaders of these armies. And you've got these, these Grand Viziers, which are, you know, as, you, as you would know, an advisor to who would be a monarch. The Grand Viziers are the c commanders of the Arabian armies under the Great Sultans. And they're very caster-esque, you know. They command the great spirits of the desert, the jinn that we've just talked about. And these jinn are not only their pets and companions, you know, they, they double as their mounts for the Bashirs as well. So it really allows them to lay waste to opponents in melee with, with fierce magic attacks, which is always great. They give you three wishes. Robin Williams' voices is going to do the voice acting for all of them. It's going to be a great time. Um, that's, not, that's not true, guys. I, I wish it was. But the great sultans then are the monarchs of Araby, and these are the melee center lords of the Arabian armies, and they're mounted atop these mighty elephants, and the Sultan is a, really a sight to see for the Arabian armies. You know, they inspire their people as well as instilling terror in the foes. But now that we've kind of got the lords down, we can jump into some of the other hero options as well. So yeah, I think now is a good time to talk about spells that are unique to Araby and her magicians, the lore of sand in particular. I'm not sure why I'm the one talking about this. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. But here we are. Arabian magicians are hero-level casters, mystics that ride flying carpets and bind desert demons and djinns to their will. Interestingly enough, there are actually only four unique spells in the Warmaster Araby supplement book, so like much of the background lore and the army roster itself, it's not truly fleshed out. Creative Assembly might have to delve deep into Games Workshop's neckbeard basement to find some unreleased army books or long-forgotten lore, or simply just get nice and creative if they want to make Araby really appealing. But they've already shown an aptitude for that with Norska, so I'm not particularly worried on that front. The four unique spells in the Lore of Sand, or Arabian magic as it were, are Sandstorm, Mirage, Sunstrike, and Curse of the Jinn. With Sandstorm, the Sorcerer commands the Desert Spirits to engulf his foes in a swirling cloud of choking sand and dust. Imagine something like the iconic chase sequence in The Mummy, where Emotep creates a sandstorm shaped like his own face and Deep Throats a Cessna. From a gameplay perspective, this is probably going to look a lot like Night Shroud from the lore of the Little Wa, with massively reduced visibility and accuracy for enemies in an area of effect. It could also be used to hinder movement. 25% reduction in enemy move speed certainly wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. The second spell creates an illusion is called Mirage, creates an illusion of a huge host of fearsome warriors, bearing down inexorably upon his startled foes. This has the potential to be a very unique spell if CA wants to get really outside the box with it. So in my mind, and this is slightly different from how it works in Warmaster, but it's true to the spirit of the spell, I think, it would create a duplicate of a unit that has zero attack and zero charge damage. So literally cannot hurt an opponent in any way. So you take your Arabian Knight unit, for instance, cast Mirage on it, and a duplicate unit is summoned right in the same spot. It has an HP pool like any other unit, and could be used as a meat shield or diversionary tactic to absorb enemy damage, soak up charges and keep enemies occupied, maybe pull an enemy spear or cav unit away from your lines, but essentially function like the perfect shaft with which to tie down and tire out opposing units. Again, wouldn't deal any damage whatsoever, but absorbs enemy damage and makes them tired over time. The third spell, Sunstrike, shoots bright beams of burning energy from the sorcerer's eyes that scythe through all before him. It functions in a direct line from the caster, and from the description and rule set, sounds more like a wind spell than a magic spell to me, or a magic missile spell. So I picture something like Chill Wind from the lore of Dark Magic, but instead of a big glacier popping out of the ground like in Total War Warhammer 2, we get Kal-El Superman unleashing laser vision in a big straight line burning through the flank of an enemy army. Maybe not quite as devastating as Wind of Death, but line it up in much the same manner, and with your caster, just let it rip. The Dryads beware, Invoker will make you have a very bad day with this particular spell. And finally, Curse of the Jinn. Channeling the immense power of the Jinn through the Sorcerer's own body lays a terrible curse upon his foes. In Tabletop, 
the target unit must re-roll all successful armor saves for the duration of the following close combat phase, which is really strong spell. It essentially means that a lot of units that survive combat on the first roll won't make it out once the player is forced to re-roll, and it can devastate units that are already locked in close quarters melee. In game, I imagine it functioning very similarly to the Curse of the Midnight Wind, which if you recall, is a big area of effect spell from the Lore of Heavens that reduces attack by 34 and armor by 30. For Curse of the Jinn, I think that armor reduction will work just fine, but instead of reducing attack, it could simultaneously reduce defense and armor as well. So any unit that gets caught in this cast will melt that much quicker. Pretty powerful AoE debuff. For the remaining two or so spells that I think that's going to basically just going to have to be CA and Games Workshop working together to figure something out. Because again, like I said, there are only four spells in the Warmaster Army book. CA is going to have to get a little bit creative, like their namesake, and figure out what to do with the, the final product there. But essentially, that is the lore of sand. Arabian magic in a nutshell. Now I think it's a good time to talk about the rest of the hero choices, legendary lords, full army roster, and how Creative Assembly could implement the faction in Total War Warhammer 2. In particular, how they could interact with the Great Vortex and what their unique mechanics would be. Okay, since we've now covered the lore of sand uh, and, and loosely touched on the caster hero in the Mystic, we can now touch on the other hero I, I, we would see in the Hashakshin. And I mean, this is kind of a self-explanatory hero, so you, you would see him as your melee hero, your assassin. So basically, you're beginning to be looking at kind of like an Altair <laughs> in a, an Araby faction. And we've already seen this new predominantly heavy assassin character focused 100% on assassination like this. In uh, Dark Elves, we've seen it now in Skaven. So maybe a Hashashin would have similar kind of mechanics with their poison weapons, very focused on attacking the enemy characters, but maybe on the campaign map, they have something that's focused on poisoning. Uh, maybe they can poison an army or poison like the supplies of a uh, of a town, maybe causing a negative growth, something like that. So it wouldn't surprise me if the Hashashim was kind of used in a both a, a heavy harassment and a assassination type role, kind of cloaking in and out of the woods. But and, uh, needless to say, maybe a stock mechanic as well, you know, assassins and whatnot. But let's jump into uh, legendary lords here before we jump into the the army list i wanted to kind of go through them uh, since that's kind of the, the big draw of any armor is it's awesome legendary lords so one would definitely be jafar and we've really already talked about jafar with the great crusades he would be our definitely more of our casting lord and as we've talked about he helped unite the arabian tribes into, into the Araby as we know it uh, but he was really feared and well known for his ability to control and conjure jinns and whim so maybe he'll have uh, some, sort of, some sort of mechanic where uh, his access to Jinns maybe gives him an increased uh, weapon strength or, or melee attack, kind of like we see with the way Throg benefits heavily into uh, Ice Trolls and the monstrous creatures of Norska, or how Wolfric benefits more heavily into the actual Norska infantry. So maybe with Jafar, he benefits into the Jinn line of things. Uh, but as we know, you know he tri triggered the Great Crusade by invading Astalia and is ignominiously killed by a nameless Bretonian, so I'm not sure what point in the uh, uh, timeline that they would use to implement Jafar, but he would be a good, a very good option for a legendary lord of, of the casting variety. Now, the other legendary lord. Now, a lot of this, a lot of people are going to know this this gentleman from Dreadfleet, but the Golden Magus is one of the captains from Dreadfleet, so a great possible lord. Though uh, he's essentially a pirate, and he mans what's the flaming scimitar, uh, his his name, his, his boat, and he's considered the Sultan of the Seas. And he's really a big icon in both Sartosa and Araby, him being a pirate and him being an Arabian, he kind of has that that duality of his fame, which is kind of interesting. So uh, maybe, he, and he already, we already know that he's a former pupil at the College of Magic and was banished for practicing forbidden arts. And that's, as we've seen, not too uncommon with uh, Arabian uh, legendary lords and sultans and such, and Jafar kind of dabbling a little bit with the darker magic of things. But he takes on this, this appearance of kind of a wise, elderly Arabian mystic versus the seafaring warrior badass that he is. Um, he's supposed to be moving, moves really quickly and gets up in people's faces when, he, when he's fighting with them. 
So it's needless to say that he just kind of takes this on almost as a, uh, a ruse, a farce. But he's well versed in sand magic and various other lores as well. So maybe he's a hybrid lord in the, in the same kind of approach that we're going to see Malekith, or the same kind of approach that we've seen in like a Manfred von Karstein. So he has a wide range of abilities. And the Flaming Scimitar is, a, I believe this ornate vessel is what it talks about in the lore, with these mazes and concentric halls, all manner of really confusing pathways. Uh, they talk about how the uh, Flaming Scimitar is not just a ship for the means of being a pirate, it's also a way for uh, the Golden Magus to store all of his plunder and his treasure. And within these secret ho hidden holds of the ship are these little jars. And each jar holds a different jinn. And those jinns are imbued with special traits. So maybe he, in one jar he's got salt water. And that equals something of like a sea nymph variety. Uh, or the Pirates of Sartosa would call that a salt devil, which is, you know, a pretty unoriginal name. But still, um, maybe uh, the Great Magus used his magic breath and, and, and put it into one of the jars, and that would make for a Tempest Jin, uh, kind of commanding the uh, the very clouds for lightning bolts. Or maybe he's got Phosphorus in another Jin in another jar, making for a Fire Efreet. So, a lot of different possibilities with these jars. Maybe he can use it as a toggle ability to summon a real quick Jin on the battlefield that's got maybe a very fast uh, breakdown time, kind of not like Krell, but maybe he'll break down quickly as, as summons do. But outside of all these three, he has this three large, I'm sorry, after outside of all these jars, he has these three larger urns. And no one, no one touches those urns, not even he does. And the big rumor is that those are stolen from Nagash and inhabited by royal jinns. And royal jinns are these gigantic spirits of the desert that just essentially blot out the sun. So he's just monster genes, just Robin Williams on roids, yelling from a mountaintop. But that kind of covers our legendary lords let's jump into the actual army list because the army list isn't too crazy on the bottom it's very kind of rudimentary right very almost empire-esque so we would see spearmen these be kind of your standard spearmen nothing special here uh, in fact i think they would just kind of look like arabian skinned themed spearmen from uh, empire bowmen again standard edition arch archery type unit so Maybe they'd use bows instead of the Empire crossbows, but again, very generic unit right here. But here's where we can kind of start to segue into a more of a, of a true Arabian-themed army. And we can start off with the Palace Guard. The Palace Guard, um, and a lot of this comes from uh, the War Master Army book, which was uh, released in, I believe, 2006. This is fleshed out a little bit as per what um, Indy Pride and I think would be uh, on point with uh, Total War Warhammer 2. So the Palace Guard, they would be kind of your, your stubborn, uh, great weapon, heavy armor kind of unit. And this is really your only real big heavy armor unit, aside from the next gentleman we're about to talk about. But these units would be very reminiscent to the Black Guard, the Phoenix Guard, but only Araby style. Um, but speaking of the other heavy armor unit, we've got the Arabian Knights slash Mamelukes that we've seen in Total War, War, Total War uh, Medieval 1 and 2. But these guys would be your heavily armored, barbed horses, typical cataphract style, shock cav, or perpetual combat. I could see them having a lance option or just your standard sword and shield option. In the in one of the actual player-made army books, they talk about the possibility of them having a devastating charge. So what that is in tabletop is a plus one attack on charge. So that would kind of lend to the more shock cav possibility of them, because that, that kind of lore that's been drummed up by um, the, that, that player created army book would make a lot of sense. But then we've got kind of rounding out the cav list here. There's two other cav options we want to talk about. The desert riders. And these would essentially be like your wild rider type shooting cav. Um, they have your vanguard type placement that shoot in a 360 arch around the arc around them. That'd be the kind of prolific to Araby is this notion of very proficient archers on horseback. So the desert riders would play very heavily into that notion as well. And then you've got a, a camel riders. Uh, they uh, they ride camels. If you if you hadn't gotten that from the name, pretty cryptic. But um, you would kind of see them as cycle charging fast cav. In the Warmaster book, they talk about a mechanic where they do have a cycling charge, and they're meant for that. So they're not really meant for long term combat, but constant hit and run, hit hit and runs. So this is something that would be like your early cav option that you'd get 
out of the tier one building in uh, the, once the start of the game starts. So the camel riders, the desert riders, would be what you'd be working with the majority of the time before you move into your Arabian Nights. Speaking of other mounts, uh, in Warmaster they've got the magic carpets. The magic carpets can be mounted by the lords. And it's pretty safe to say that the lords would have a variety of mounts, right? Maybe the sultan, the melee lord, can ride a camel, an Arabian steed, or a war elephant. Maybe and maybe the Grand Vizier, the, uh, the caster lord, uh, or vizier, he can mount the jinn or a magic carpet. So it, it makes a lot of sense that they would have that. But at the same time, we've seen a lot of bombing type, or at least uh, flying cav in Total War Warhammer 2 and in Total War Warhammer 1. We've seen them in Hawk Riders, but we've also seen them in the soon-to-come Pterodons. So these guys would shoot in a very shallow $360, or 360 arc, not dollar. <laughs> we wish it was. Um, but maybe they have the possibility of dropping flaming pots, or uh, just like the gyrocopters can, or maybe a, a fire variant and a poison variant. So maybe they, they can drop snakes uh, onto the enemy to, to do some poison damage. So there's a lot of possibilities with the magic carpet mounted with Napatun, or the gentleman who would throw these flaming pots or these uh, poisoned pots filled with snakes. And we have seen pretty interesting mechanic with Norska. We've seen mammoths. And very true to the Arabian uh, Warmaster book and as well as the lore, there are war elephants in the Arabi army. So not your typical mastodons, not your, not your single unit large monstrous cav. I would see this as kind of a smaller unit of monstrous cav, maybe six to eight per, maybe, something around that area. But you'd have those howdos on top, just like previous Total Wars with, with those mammoths and with the new lizardmen dinosaurs we're going to get with the stegodons and the, and the uh, bastilodons but at this having ranged capabilities as well as devastating close combat. So they kind of have a thick skin, giving it a little bit of armor, but it would cause terror as elephants always do in these games. But I think a, a nifty mechanic, rather than the rampage that we would get from a lizardman, what if there was a stampede mechanic? Since these are not mammoths, and mammoths, you know, iconically are very like tough, gnarled creatures of, of, of the ice age. But elephants, you know, they see, they see a mouse and they shit their pants and run. So maybe if Skaven are nearby, they run quickly, but that's a joke. <laughs> but to maybe a mechanic where stand, they stampede at low health if struck by fire or magic attack, or maybe even rather than breaking, it just stampedes with the leadership as well. So it has a, a possibility, almost like a, a vortex spell to just run right through your whole army or the enemies. You don't know. That's the kind of randomness of bringing the war elephants, I would think. But we've, we've kind of roughly talked on the Napatoon when we talked about the magic carpets but it would make a lot of sense if we had them on foot as well. Very grenade-style infantry in the same vein as the poison wind globadiers. So lobbing poison or flaming pot slash grenades over units. And I think they'd have that same kind of mechanic we see with the poison wind globadiers. Light armor, high damage. And that's, uh, I really am excited to see how the poison wind globadiers work because they talk about how you can get them really close to units and huck things over them. So I'm, I'm excited to see that mechanic duplicated across multiple factions. We already kind of have something similar with that with the dwarves and the iron breakers and, and the miners, but uh, I feel like it could be better used um, because it's a pretty nifty mechanic. Then one unit that, that's probably going to be one of the more elite units for the army would be the, the, the dervishes, the whirling dervishes, and they would have maybe your, your poisoned attacks, they'd be very fast on foot, they're immune to psychology, but they would definitely be a lot lighter armored. There's got to be a trade-off, right? You can't have all this damage being poured out with the poison on it too and without some sort of trade-off. So definitely very lightly armored, um, more of a damage dealer type unit and meant to really get up and mince infantry. So an, an AMTA infantry mechanic as well. I don't think an AP infantry or an AP mechanic on there because then it's like, okay, what haven't we given them that they can do damage with? So just an anti infantry poison attack. Um, but they would have maybe a toggle ability that gives them range defense as a reduction to speed though. So you click that ability, they start whirling around like whirling dervishes do and vastly reducing their speed because they're dancing like crazy men, but also increasing their range defense by maybe a static amount. Uh, so very similar to kind of the war dancers, regiments of renown we've seen with their toggleable dances. And uh, rounding off the army here, we've got two other little options we could possibly be looking at with the with the rock, you know, ROC, the huge birds of prey. 
think kind of the High Elf, Wood Elf, Great Eagles. So it's kind of a simple monstrous unit that can harass backlands and target war machines, causes fear or terror, just something to kind of help flesh out that army list. Maybe there's a possibility that we would see a Jin as a single unit to have in and of itself, kind of like uh, uh, we see with some of the other larger monstrous units. Um, it's drawing a blank for some reason. But the last thing on this list I'd say would be an Onager. So your standard edition kind of catapult. And maybe it has the ability to fire a fiery uh, NAFTA bomb or adding some fire damage to the unit as, as a toggleable. So we've seen that in, in other Total Wars too, where you can click a button and, and all of your archers now shoot flaming arrows or all of your uh, catapults are now used shooting flaming pots. So it'd be interesting to bring that back because we don't really see that a lot in Total War Warhammer uh, because it's not really used a lot in the actual tabletop. And I think they're trying to stick as close as they can to that overall um, feel of tabletop. But now that we've kind of discussed the army list, we've gone over the lords, we've gone over the heroes and the, and the magic, let's talk about some of the actual unique characteristics and mechanics, as well as the uh, great vortex mechanics that would make Araby very unique. So yeah, given everything we've talked about thus far, it should be pretty clear how Araby will actually play on the battlefields of Total War Warhammer 2, should they indeed become playable. They're the foil for Bretonia. Where knightly orders, a hypocritical sense of chivalry, and powerful heavy cavalry charges echo the Western European knights of our world, Araby shares countless similarities with the Ayyubid and Turkish dynasties of the Crusader period and the Middle Ages at large. Alongside Bretonia, Araby is amongst the most medieval factions in the setting, obviously possessing of some fantasy elements, but tactically speaking, not far off from how the Muslim dynasties conducted themselves on the battlefields of the Third Crusade. If you're looking for a more traditional Total War faction to play, Araby should fit right into that mold. Blocks of spearmen, light skirmisher cavalry, camels with a bonus first large, Mameluke cataphract style shock troops, and war elephants. Very high stamina, good mobility, and reliant on, mic on good micromanagement and troop positioning, and of course, the almighty hammer and anvil are going to be the things that characterize this faction. Those gigantic birds of prey called rocks, and the flying carpets will give you some options in the air, but Araby will probably lose a full-on air battle to a decent chunk of the current Warhammer cast, so air superiority is not really going to be one of their strong suits. Basically, if you've ever played with Egypt or the Turks in Medieval 2, you're looking at the a very similar style of tactics with Araby in Total War Warhammer 2. Now, Araby is well known for their navigational expertise and exploratory nature on the high seas. Their powerful navies have carved out a trading empire on the Great Ocean that very few in the Warhammer universe can rival. Their Explorers of the Great Ocean trait, which is what I've called it, would give you a list of coastal settlements to capture on the Great Vortex campaign map. In Albion, in the Gulf of Sufaga, where the Pirates of Sartosa ply their trade, in Skeggy, the Fortress of Dawn at the tip of the Southlands, and the Fortress of Dusk at the tip of Lustria, and the Bleak Coast to the southeast of Nagaroth. In each of these vital coastal settlements, Araby could create unique trade buildings from which the wealth of the New World could flow back to Kofor, the Sheikh, and the other city-states. Controlling these trade hubs would provide gigantic economic bonuses and reduce unit upkeep as raw materials flow back to Araby, but similar to the rituals of the other factions, each of these trade hubs would come under repeated assault by the other major players of the New World and from the forces of Chaos, who would want to tear down everything you built. Now, why would Araby care about the Great Vortex? Well, they aren't expressly a good or bad faction. We heard in the lore that Sultan Jafar and his people were willing to ally with the Skaven and invade the factions of order, so they're certainly capable of great evil, as all men are, but they're capable of great deeds and beneficence as well. So unlike the Dark Elves and Skaven, who must unbind the Great Vortex for their own gain and the destruction of others, and the Lizardmen and the High Elves, who must save it, for the good of the planet to keep out the forces of chaos, the Arabians should have a choice to ally with order or ally with the forces of darkness. It would be a really cool mechanic if the grayness inherent with human civilization was represented, and that the player themselves had the choice to become an evil despot or a force for good. A choice that would have a very meaningful impact on the endgame. Unbinding the Great Vortex would give you access to a royal djinn, a greater demon equivalent of immense size with powerful casting abilities, but as a trade-off, this awesome endgame unit, as a trade-off for getting that unit, you would basically have Empire and Bretonia arise up, and they would see you as a reincarnation of Sultan Jafar. 
that tyrannical despot with the potential to threaten the world. So crusading armies of Empire and Bretonian Knights would spawn near Sartosa and make their way to the coast of Araby to finish off your cities one final time. That's what would happen if you allied with the forces of evil and decided to try to unbind the Great Vortex. Now, if you chose to be a force for good and help restore the Vortex, two armies of your choosing could get allied Wa or Bray Herd equivalents, where High Elf and Lizardmen armies follow you around as a reward for working alongside the forces of order. These would be AI controlled and follow your armies, helping you win battles until the 20 stack is finally whittled down over time after enough fighting. So you'd get diplomatic bonuses with the factions of order, Lizardmen, specifically the Azur and Children of the Old Ones themselves, but the trade-off there would be steep diplomatic repercussions with the Skaven and the Dark Elves, if you aren't already at war with them, and Chaos would turn its malevolent gaze towards you. Instead of a massive crusade of the Knightly Orders, you'd have Chaos sweep down on you in massive waves. But all this is being said without knowing what the endgame for Total War Warhammer 2 will actually look like. We don't know what that will be yet, right? Is it going to be a Chaos Invasion? Is it going to be a greater demon like Nakari, that Keeper of Secrets, that has a long-standing rivalry with Malekith and with the Azur? Or are we looking at a Vermin Lord, maybe like Screech Vermin King? By the time the Tomb Kings and presumably Araby roll around, will Ark in the Black and or Nagash be part of the picture? Because if they are, they would be probably an even better and more flavorful endgame when compared to Chaos. Ultimately, it's hard to know how CA is going to handle the endgame just yet. Obviously, a lot of this is speculation, but I think that decision mechanic where you choose between saving and unbinding the Great Vortex could be a lot of fun and give the player a lot of choice there. Now, as we've seen in Warhammer 2, in addition to the ritual mechanic, each faction has rights, minor objectives that must be completed to summon special units like the Doom Engineer for the Skaven. Arabian rights could, of course, summon lower level jinns, powerful spirits that can blast apart units with their devastating spells, or even allow access to the Flaming Scimitar, which is the Golden Magus's own pleasure barge known worldwide for its prowess on the high seas. This vessel would give you a massive leg up in any auto-resolve naval battles and cover significantly more sea per turn when compared to traditional transport ships. So instead of taking maybe three, four, or five turns to cross over to another continent, it might only take one or two. Ships can't raid in Total War Warhammer 1. That was actually one of the things that was, I haven't really talked about it, but was kind of disappointing about the Norska DLC. Uh, sea raiding is a very important component of the Norskan Peninsula and the factions that reside there. But it would be pretty cool if the Golden Magus and the Flaming Scimitar, which are renowned for their piracy, had access to a unique raiding stance where they can suck income out of enemy coastal settlements without landing. I think that would be pretty awesome. So your regular navy might not be able to actually do that raiding stance on the high seas with the transport ships, but if you got access to the Flaming Scimitar through your right, you would get access to that, and that would be a great way to supplement your income and provide a bit of unique gameplay mechanics and flavor. If the Pirates of Sartosa ever get added to the game, I think we can definitely imagine that their entire transport fleet in general would be able to raid in much the same way and be able to plop itself outside a port or out on the open sea and raid enemy trading routes. Now, I think we need to be careful about making Air B too cool. We re don't really want them outshining the major players of the Warhammer Fantasy Battle universe. We don't want them to be cooler than the Azur or the Children of the Old Ones, or the Drukai, or the Skaven, but I think with some or all of these mechanics, they would be an absolute blast to play, and certainly be worthy of being implemented in the Total War Warhammer trilogy, specifically in Game 2. When will they be dropping? We have absolutely no idea. Are they going to be dropping? Again, not sure, but I think there have been more than enough hints to suggest that Araby makes a lot of sense. So, Italian. We've been talking about Araby for a while now. What are your final thoughts on the faction? What do you really want to see brought to life? Is there anything else you want to say about Araby before we say goodbye to the viewers? Uh, I think, you know, you really nailed it on the head, especially in that last part. Like, this is going to be maybe, if, if they add Araby, something that would be kind of a, a nod to the historical players, the players that wanted something that's a little more, less elvish, less dwarvish. And just like you were mentioning too, the only faction that kind of mirrors this is Bretonia. And really CA does a really good job of taking stuff from the books that doesn't exist and making it things in this game. So obviously Bretonians live by a very strong uh, chival chivalric code. 
but there's no actual chivalry meter or anything like that on tabletop or any kind of incurring penalties from, you know, fleeing or anything like that. CA does a really good job of kind of reading in between the lines. So if they were to do an Araby army, I think that the some of the mechanics that we talked about are, are really on point for what we would see because we had to do a lot of reading in between the lines to create this video to begin with. But um, I'm, I'm really excited for the possibility of Jin in the game in some way or another. Like they're always, they've always kind of been a really cool thing from a lore perspective of Warhammer, from a fantasy perspective of playing like the Heroes of Might and Magic games growing up. Genies are always kind of a cool thing. So I think that that would be kind of a nice flavorful addition to the uh, the arid desert wastelands of, of the northern Southlands. But I think those are, those are some of the big things I'm, I'm really excited about. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things about being a human faction in the Warhammer Fantasy Battle universe is that, especially with something like Araby and Bretonia, these factions are pretty grounded in reality when you compare them to elves mm -hmm. or compare them to dwarfs or lizard men. So being able to see this human faction that doesn't have overwhelming technology would function a lot like a medieval faction would. If you, if you took, right. a, not ancient Egypt, but medieval Egypt, and plopped it into the Warhammer Fantasy Battle universe, that's pretty much what you'd be getting with this faction. Pretty down to earth, of course there are a couple fantasy elements like the djinn, like the rocks, the gigantic birds of prey from Arabic lore, but I think it's just awesome to see these kind of factions kind of carve out their empire when they're dealing with hell pit abominations, they're dealing with greater demons of chaos, they're dealing with these right. monstrosities from the warp that any regular person from this world you would think would just absolutely crap their pants if they saw something <laughs> that terrifying. But carving out that empire, beating back the tides of chaos with a medieval faction, that's just a blast. I mean, I had a blast with it in the Bretonia campaign. Araby, again, not going to play exactly like Bretonia, but a lot of that same kind of flavor and feel in terms of being that medieval faction. So I think there's a lot to be excited for with Araby. I think that there are some really cool mechanics if CA wants to get very creative, they could implement. Um, and I want to hear what you guys have to say. Like, I'm sure we we did lots of brainstorming and discussing about how these kind of game mechanics could get implemented in Total oh, War yeah. Warhammer 2, but I'm sure some of you guys are going to have even better ideas. So definitely let us know in the comment section below, what do you want to see out of Araby? What units? I'm sure we haven't covered every unit that could possibly get added. Um, what mechanics, how do you think that they would interact with the Great Vortex, what would be the bonuses, what would be the drawbacks of allying or trying to destroy the forces of order. There's a lot of stuff to talk about there. Definitely let us know in the comment section below. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I hope you guys enjoyed listening to Italian Spartacus join me on this video. Definitely go check out his channel, link will be in the pinned comment and the description below. And. Yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. I'll talk to you next time. Any Pride signing out for now. Thanks, guys.